Today, we are going to be talking about autism in pop culture. So how has autism been represented? Sometimes great, sometimes not so great. And we're going to be looking at a nice broad range today. Now, let's talk a little bit about exceptional individuals because I see some new faces today. We are a UK based organisation. And it's interesting, a lot of people from the UK today, we normally get people from all over the world, which is interesting. And we're a UK organisation, been going about six years now, or maybe seven, time does fly. And we specialise in neurodiversity. So that's just a cognitive variation of the human brain. Things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, all of those. And we do subjects like, what is dyslexia? What's the history of autism? But I also think it's important to know about our culture and society. Because we're always talking about all oh, discrimination and overcoming bias and stigma. But the truth is the media influences this more than anything. So understanding about on screen and written representation is important. So Ant says, can you email the slides to us? We can also have slides available if that would be of use. So yeah, oh, Iwa, Ewa, sorry, has said, I am neurotypical myself, but support autistic children and young people who are transitioning into adult life. I believe pop culture can help them do that and increase their confidence. Absolutely. So here we are, autism in pop culture. Some of you may have attended the one we did a few weeks ago on dyspraxia. Now, dyspraxia was an interesting one because they're really wasn't much media out there that was official autism of, on the other hand there is far more and there was we also did one on dyslexia which you can watch in our youtube video but with autism whether it's official or not is not so much disputed it's more about whether or not it was done tastefully and done in good light we will as we go on you, you'll see that representation is mixed we're not just going to be focusing on Rayman today, just so you're all aware. So what do we actually mean by pop culture? You know, it means a lot to a different people. First of all, mod pop culture is modern popular culture transmitted via mass media. So, for example, something that everyone or most people know, common knowledge. Um, let's take Power Rangers. A lot of you probably don't watch Power Rangers, but you have heard of it. Or... Susan Boyle from Britain's Got Talent. You might not listen to her music, but you'll be aware of who she is roughly. So that's what we're talking about. You might not definitely know it, but enough people know it for it to be ingrained in our culture. To start off with, what media can you think of that includes an autistic character without any kind of, I don't know, persuasion from my side I want to know who do you already know and see if you've got any that I've never heard of Lisa says Sesame Street yes Sesame Street is a great example interestingly they worked with the I think it was the National Autistic Society to create the representation but they recently dropped out but I will go into a bit more detail about Sesame Street in a bit Snowcake never watched it The Good Doctor yes I know he has autism she -Ra, I've heard of it, not watched it. Hollyoaks, Oh Arthur, definitely, Rayman, classic. Power Rangers, 2017, In a Beat, The Good Doctor on Sky, Woman from the Chase. Oh yes, what's her name? The, is it the governess? Anne Hathaway? Have, have, wait, like, she has autism, which is, you know, she's your classic kind of Rayman character, like, oh, the autistic genius. And we are going to be looking at tropes. A trope is something which appears time and time again, you know, like the dumb blonde or um, the uh, eccentric billionaire, you know, things that aren't true, but have been a pitch, you know, said time and time again. OK, we've also got the accountant, Ben Affleck, Maurice Moss from the IT crowd. Nice. I love Moss. My children love Pablo, which I believe is written by autistics. I have Snowcake on DVD because I couldn't find a decent online streaming version of it, but I haven't watched it yet. Oh, thanks, April. I've never heard of it myself. Hill, Loop, yes, Loop by Pixar, the little short. Captain Holt from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, maybe, definitely could be. Sheldon from Big Bang, interesting. So this is actually really, really good, and you, the A word, 
Well, yeah, most of these I got actually, but not all of them. So this is why it's always great to know because it allows me to do more research. And some of these people are definitely officially written as autistic, yet some of them are just hinted towards. Lisa's also done atypical. Nice. So with that in mind, let's start working our way through it. I'm starting off with anime and manga. There tends to be a strong link between autistics and manga and anime. Why? I don't know. I mean, if any of you are a big manga fan or anime, I would love to know. I've got no science to back this up, but most people who I know who are on the spectrum tends to gravitate towards this more, this type of media. And obviously it's mostly based in Japan, but doesn't have to be. It's more about the style. Yes, Chantel says, I love anime and manga. So some of them is Aspi-chan, Shazanka, or With the Light. Now, I am not fam overly familiar with the last two, but these are the ones that I, I do know about the first one. So the first one I'm going to start off with is Aspi-chan. Aspi-chan is relatively new. It's an adorable little comic strip, and the character has Asperger's. And what's really nice about it is... It was, done, it was created in a way to spread awareness on what Asperger syndrome is. It was created by a Japanese cosplayer, so that's someone who dresses up in like anime costumes, and artist. And Aspi-chan, obviously short for Asperger's. If you're looking for a nice positive representation, I think this is a really nice one. It's a really kind of cute, adorable little cartoon. Oh yeah, I, Megan says I've noticed this too. I, I'm very curious to explore a little bit more about why certain cognitive ways of thinking gravitate towards certain mediums. Really curious to know. I mean, obviously, I've got theories, but nothing to back it up with. The next one is comic books. Comic books are a fantastic way to escape the world, particularly interested by those with dyslexia, or I know that I was. I grew up with Beano and Dandy. And that's because I really struggled to read long form books, but for breaking it down to smaller chunks was far more manageable. But with autism, it can also be quite a popular area because it allows you to get truly immersed into something, become an expert. Those with ASD do have a knack of, oh, maybe obsession is too much of a strong word, but a very keen interest in a particular thing. So you might know every character, you might know all their origins, their multiple timelines. And as a result, the people who write comic books have started to include autism in their characters. And we're going to be looking at a few of them. Um, it says, yes, I love com comics. Is someone dyslexia? No, nah, comics are great. Or graphic novels, depending on what you like to call them. So the first one I'm going to start off with is these three. We've got in Aquaman, we've got Black Manta. He's a supervillain, by the way. So whether or not we think that's positive, we'll get on to that. Legon or Legon, I can't know how to, I don't know, I do not know how to pronounce it, but Charles Xavier, you know from X-Men, the guy, the person in the wheelchair with the bold Legion. head. Who can, oh, sorry? Legion. Legion. Thank you so much. Legion. Um, yeah, Legion is Xavier's like estranged son or Professor X. Not so much a main character, but still included. And then Laura Dean, who is Goblin's twin, you know, like Green Goblin. Now, as you know, comic book history is a little bit, you know, not that consistent, but this is what I was able to research. Shantawa says, I like the mix of visuals and writing. I don't mind all the detailed books with write, but it's the visuals are good. I also like clear expressions on the character faces. Yes, that's a really good, um, a really good point, actually. Maybe it's that how visual comics are, that you can really see their facial expressions. And in anime, you know, when they're annoyed, you get like bubbles above their head, like really detailed lines. I never thought of that before, but that does actually make a lot of sense. Uh, Matt, one of the things I heard about with comics is that because they're drawn in set panels, you get involved with them because you are filling in the missing action from panel to panel. Interesting. Thank I, get, I never thought about that, but it, it does make sense. It allows you to explore your imagination i guess in a, in a different way i never really knew why I, I was always drawn to comics but i guess i was i also love the simpsons comics as well the futurama ones 
I never got that much into Marvel. I was always into, um, well, to be fair, I was only into the comics that they sold at my local WH Smiths. Uh, and they never did Marvel back in uh, when I was growing up because uh, it wasn't that popular in, you know, with all the movies. Obviously, it's always been popular, but you had to go to more like niche uh, dedicated stores. Tony says, what was the Aspie Chan? Aspie Chan is like a little comic strip, which you can just find online. I'll just say Google it and you can watch or read all the comics. Shontown says, I like a mixture. Oh, yes. Lisa says, I thought Legion had DID. That is why the name is Legion. They are many. I don't think they were ASD. Well, this is where, Lisa, you are right. It gets a little bit blurry because you'll find some sources that confirm it others that deny it and other sources which hint towards it. Sometimes one writer will say one thing and another writer will change the narrative. You know, in comic books, we usually use the term canon, which means official in that universe, but they have never been that consistent. April says, a similar term to a comic strip or a graphic novel is a picture story. The pictures tell terms especially applied to girls, comics such as Bunty. Yes, I remember April, you saying you used to, used to or do collect Bunty. So there's a couple of comic books. Now, the first one I'm going to look at is Black Manta. Black Manta is a, a villain. And you know, I thought it's quite interesting to have a potentially autistic villain. So as you can see, this is a weird kind of alien being in a robot. And is there much that tells you he has Asperger's or autism? Not really. There's nothing to me which kind of gives it away. So yeah, it's, it's kind of like a bug thing in a robot suit. Now on this one, I would say maybe it's more apparent in the comic books than it has been in how it's been represented in visuals. But I, a question I want to ask a lot of you is that, are you okay with the fact that it's an autistic supervillain? Like, does it matter whether it's a good or a bad character? Like, for instance, yes, autistics can be evil too, so you don't really mind, you know, it, it's fair representation. Or when we're showing representation, because there isn't much of it on TV or media, it should be positive. Because the truth is, people's understanding of conditions is highly based on the media they consume. And let's say all they're doing is watching, I don't know, like, like, th th like that Aquaman, the only understanding they'll have of autism is villain. It's like when you watch a James Bond movie, you know, all the villains tend to be blonde hair and German or something. I'm like, Hey, come on. <laughs> you know, there, there tends to be these certain stereotypes which stick depending on what country. Like in most American movies, the Russian is always the bad guy. The dyslexic is always the kind of uh, misbehaving underdog. The autistic person is always a super genius who doesn't just quite fit into society. Now, a lot of you have said, yeah, autistics can be evil too. And I'm kind of for this in a way. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but when it comes to talking about disabilities, it's like, you know, we cannot be jerks. Just because you're disabled doesn't mean you can't be a jerk. You are just like anyone else. You have, you can be good, you can be bad, you can be happy, you can be sad. It's like, just because there's someone, someone doesn't like you and someone says, you can't say that to them. You know, you, you can. I'm not asking people to discriminate against me, but all I'm saying is, you know, I, ha I can be all the quality that you can, even if they're not positive. Megan has says, I think it would be fine if we had lots of representation, but at the moment, I think we need more positive representation. Autism is often demonized currently. I agree with you on that. Vicky says it's difficult to answer. Autistic can be evil too. <laughs> However, if someone has no prior knowledge of autism, they're likely to see it in a bad light. I, I agree with you. I think as we get more representation, it's better to show a broad representation. But currently, the fact is, this could be someone's first and only exposure to an autistic character. Next to films, and we've got the classic Rayman on the left. He was the first um, popular representation of autism in media. And Hoffman, who played the title of character, 
wasn't autistic, though he did spend a lot of time with people with autism to understand them, to like mimic their responses. But being Hollywood, it was kind of like slightly amped up. I, for my personal opinion, Rayman is a great first step. Maybe a bit outdated now, but for the time, I would say it was more positive than negative. However, if any of you have been made fun of, like being called, oh, Rayman in the past, maybe you'd have a different opinion. So some films, we've got The Big Short, we've got Change Your Habit, The Fanatic, Music, and Power Rangers 2017, which I know one of you mentioned earlier. I'm going to go into a bit more detail on each of these, but you'll see some of these I would say are, are good representations, but unfortunately, most of them are not. So first of all, The Big Short. If any of you have not seen The Big Short, it's quite a boring concept, but they try to make it quite interesting. So it's about like people getting rich, you know, beating the system. And when you watch it, Christian Bale's character was written as autistic. However, in the film, they never mention it. But in a deleted scene, they show it. So in this film, like he's given an explanation on a financial concept. He's he's acting a bit non-typical. And then someone says to him, you know, oh, you know, I think you might have um, Asperger's. And he's like, yeah, I do. Now, unfortunately, I think this would have been a good representation because it's talking about how it's strained on relationships. It also explains why he's like really good with numbers, but also why as employable and successful as he is, he also struggles with one to one communication. Now, apparently the director felt that it didn't really add to the narrative and it kind of took away for it. So for that reason, they got rid of it. This is a little bit of a cheeky example because it's not in the official release, but it is in the deleted scenes. So there is the big short. Next on is Power Rangers. I love the Power Rangers. Growing up, I, I always wanted to be Tommy, the White Ranger, previously the Green Ranger, but there was no autistic character, not officially. And then in 2017, they remade the Power Rangers and the Blue Ranger was autistic. Now, if you watch it, I actually think it's a, a fairly all right representation. I'm not saying it's a great film, but it is a good representation. So for those of you who are like looking to show St. Paul's to their kids, it may be a good first step. With a lot of these, though, I recommend watching it first and seeing and asking yourself, is this the representation I want to show them? Because once that first view of how they see themselves is embedded in their head, it's very difficult to change that. Now, more and more characters and more and more TV shows are being rebooted and recreated. And with that, we're like, OK, this character is now gay. This character is now autistic. You know, this character now has an eating disorder. We're adding them on to increase diversity and representation. But I want to know how you feel about retrofitting characters with ASD. That's a term which I know I've kind of made up for this. But how do you feel about a character who originally wasn't autistic being rewritten or recreated in a remake or a reboot with those qualities? Is that a good thing? Because we're talking about it and we're showing that autism is part of our society, so it should be included. Or is it a negative because we're doing it just for the sake of doing it? Now, if you ask this question to individuals who aren't neurodiverse or autistic, you'll get a very different answer. But I've never asked an autistic community before. So I've got, I think there should be more representation within pop culture, within ASD. So that's very like for and pro. It's positive for greater representation as long as they avoid stereotypes and tropes. No, that's a, a solid answer. If it fits the character and makes sense to the story, then I think it's okay. Yeah, sometimes it just doesn't fit within the narrative. And you're like, oh, well, what's the point? It's still representation, so I'm okay with it at the moment. Yeah, and I, there really isn't a right or wrong answer. I'm honestly not trying to persuade anyone's opinions here. I'm still very undecided about it. The fact we're talking about it right now is a good thing. So I, I guess there is a lot of positives. 
This doesn't include a fictional character, but one celebrity who was diagnosed with autism in retrospect was Stanley Kubrick. That's a really good point, and I don't actually include Kubrick today. With Because it, it's a real person, though, it becomes a bit more problematic. With a cartoon, maybe it's not so uh, controversial. I think there should be a statistical truthful representation of autistic community, yeah. Many people who class themselves as neurotypical often have traits of autism that they may not be aware of. To bring out the acceptance is a good thing. Great. Sometimes it's better than nothing. So I think most people here agree. Daniel says, I'm not sure as the reboot tends to ignore canon, makes a new character that could fit with others. That's another good point as well. Like Doctor Who. It makes you wonder, OK, Doctor Who, when they, when they made Doctor Who a woman, was that bad i don't know because like he's never been a female before but also he's an alien so there's no reason why he can't be a she or james bond when they were thinking about making james bond black is that controversial i mean i have no issue with it i mean some people have issues with it because it's like maybe they have issues with race but i think sometimes it was more about well the character that ian flemings wrote wasn't meant to be it's a really difficult one and i think we do not have like all the answers needed if we can start creating characters from scratch that are whatever we want to represent that's probably the best option but with like media and the way things are created we always goes with tried and tested methods okay we've got still other comments many people will class them uh, it's complicated because the characters could have been coded as autistic in the original piece so saying it is a reboot kind of works and explicitly says it that's another great point as well uh, another great example is in a lot of media it's always been stigmatized and taboo or even against the law to be gay uh, and in media is always existed but it has to be hidden or coded and if it was remade today, why would you code it? Because there's nothing wrong with it. You know, it's we're open about it in society on the whole. So maybe characters were coded as autistic and now it's just being more open about it. Maybe do we need to know that for its original intent? Maybe not. It would be great to have movies and instant characters who just happen to have autism, not just a super important part of the story. That's another really good point as well. My narrative isn't related to autism. I just happen to have it. Some people are diagnosed later, so it can make sense. The most important thing is about raising awareness. If it gets people talking about it, then it's a good thing. OK, wow. A lot of reviews here. I would say on the whole, most of us are very for it. But there's obviously some reservations, but no one's dead against it. Next is animation. I know I've mentioned anime a bit, but I wanted to keep that separate. We're mainly going to be talking about Western animations. And one of you have already mentioned Arthur. Arthur is a great TV show for kids, and I highly recommend watching it if you haven't grown up with it. I think they've only recently stopped making it. So some of the animations we're going to be looking at is Mary and Max, a stop mo a like play animation. Archer, which is an adult's uh, cartoon. Arthur which is a children's cartoon, a Pixar short called Loop, which one of you already mentioned today, and Rick and Morty. Now, some of these are subtle references, some of them are throwaway lines, and others are like baked into the overall narrative. April says, I heard Arthur will end on its 25th season. Yeah, me too. Go to YouTube, type in exceptional individuals or um, on our website. Let's get into this, because I think for these are really interesting. First of all is, Mary and Max. Mary and Max is based on autism, like it was created with autism in mind. As you can see on the t-shirt there, Aspies, another word for Asperger's, for freedom. And this is about someone, it's quite a very dark movie to be fair, not just because it's mostly black and white, but because it's about someone who's like very lonely and it's all about how the brain works and like being pen paled back and forward. So as you can see, this is included in the story. It's a vital part of the narrative. Maybe not so great for like young children, just because of like some of the themes. But I do like the fact that it was integral to the narrative. But as you can see, this person is uh, a little bit depressed. 
And there's a lot, as you can see, they go back to like flashbacks to when he was a child, misunderstanding social situations, not really bonding with the world. It's a negative representation, not because it's a bad representation, but because it mainly focuses on the challenges. But there are also elements of it which goes into the genius side, like solving a Rubik's Cube really fast. Obviously, that's a bit of a cliche, and I'm pretty sure the vast majority of us can't solve Rubik's Cubes. I know I can't. But I'm not opposed to this film, not at all. Chantel says this is such a beautiful play motion. I like it. It's a little bit arty for some people. And it might not show autism in a stereotypical happy light, but I think it does quite a good job of balancing pros and cons. But is it uplifting? No. Is it beautiful? Yes. Next one is Loop. Now, Loop is a very uplifting animation and very beautiful it's only like for pixar the disney company they are allowed so much time to work on like new initiatives and new projects and loop was one that they created i can't remember what film it was accompanying april you may know this what film it was originally associated with but it's a guy who doesn't have autism he's on a boat and she's acting very unusual and he's like i don't know what's going on and he just wants a nice little ride on his boat. And she keeps touching the things. And obviously, with autism, she's getting like stimulated from it. Like she finds it therapeutic, very relaxing. And he is now trying it himself. He's like, well, maybe if I give it a go, I'll kind of have that empathy. And it's not really working for him. So then she gets an app. And the app is a way like makes dog barking, different sounds. And at first, he's like, just stop using it. But eventually he learns to realise that's a way that she's able to communicate. And what starts off as a misunderstanding turns into like a love and a deep appreciation of her differences. So as you can see here, it's definitely a form of more, more stronger traits of autism. So maybe not so much Asperger's, probably more like classic autism. But it's not a bad first introduction that difference is different, but not bad. April says, I really enjoyed Mary and Max, even with its dark themes, although I like the stop motion. Another Pixar short was inspired by autism is Float. The little boy's special floating ability is a metaphor for autism. I didn't know that. So that's, that's really interesting. So, yeah, I can. Loop is definitely family friendly. I've got no reason not to recommend this if you want to introduce someone to autism, but make it very clear while watching, this is just one form of autism, non-verbal. And a lot of people with autism aren't non-verbal. Now for literature, good old literature. We've got The Curious Case of the Dog in the Nighttime, which is also a play, Ready Player One. And we're gonna go into both of these. So don't worry about reading this too much. First, Ready Player One. If any of you have read not read this book, I recommend it. It's a great book. I thought it was just for like children and maybe it is, but it really caught my attention. If you love the 80s, if you love like classic games, it's very immersive. The main character who we do not see, James Holiday, he's like this genius guy who created this like universe. He's so eccentric and he's so detailed orientated. So when they're talking about autism, they're coming from a very strength-based approach. Like this person is so meticulous. He's so detailed orientated. He does come across a little bit unusual, but not in a bad way. Like he's very much um, praised in this like universe because he created something which everyone is absorbed in. Then we've got the curious case of the dog in the nighttime. This is also a really famous play. This is about an autistic 15 year old who tries to solve the murder of his neighbor's dogs. And what I like about this representation is autism isn't like necessarily a hindrance. It's something which allows this person to see life in a different perspective, which helps them solve a mystery, which maybe someone who isn't autistic would struggle or not be able to see from that perspective. I want to ask you now, can you think of any other characters that we've missed from a book or a film, if you want a big reader, that you have related to? So if you have autism or it suspect you might have autism, is there a character which you think, you know what, though they may not be officially autistic, I connect with them. For me, 
is Huckleberry Finn. I've always loved Huckleberry Finn. For me, he's a bit of a scallywag, but uh, he's someone who I, I can see a bit myself in. But probably more Tom Sawyer. Okay, we've got Joe March. I love the use of illustrations in Curious Incident. Yes, that's great. Cool. Mr. Monk from The Monks. I've not actually watched that, Daniel. Is it a good? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, I'll, I'll give it a watch. And sometimes we have to do this. We have to place ourselves in a character because that's what characters are meant to do at the end of the day. They're meant to be a certain personality which you connect with and you're rooting for because you see yourself in them. Now for TV. TV, I think, has a, maybe a few more representations because maybe they're less of a commitment than a movie. Now, first of all, we've got Atypical. Atypical is a show which is based on autism as the central theme. The Big Bang Theory, which isn't officially about autism, but we are going to talk a bit about that soon. Community, which um, I'll talk a bit more about Community. Community is a great comedy and I highly recommend it. Abed is an autistic film student and researching for Abed helps Siri. Uh, sorry. So Abed, he is a very eccentric, unique individual, but everyone loves him for his uh, creativeness. He always has references. He is like, a, he is pop culture in a person. He knows every reference. A lot of people with autism will tend to reference things and you, that you might not know the reference, but to them they will. And The Good Doctor, which I know one of you had already mentioned previously. Monica from Friends, definitely could be. So now on the Big Bang Theory, if any of you have watched the Big Bang Theory, it went on for long enough. A lot of people always relate to Sheldon Cooper as autistic, but yet the writers of Big Bang Theory have always denied, not even not commented, denied that he is autistic. Whether they did that because they didn't think it was relevant or whether he really wasn't, who knows? But he is always very particular. He likes his routine. He has a very set way of doing things. So I would say he does represent autism. Sometimes he's not, he doesn't show great emotional intelligence when he misunderstands situations, but ultimately he's a very caring individual under the surface. So with that, do you think Sheldon was based on, an, on autistic traits? Like regardless of what the producers and the writers have said, when they were creating him, do you think he was, or do you think it's more of a coincidence? Hill says, a lot of characters from LC, Morrison Brooks, are neurodivergent, also the Brown sisters. I didn't know that. So a lot of you think he was. My gut is he was. Why they didn't want to speak about it, who knows? Maybe they just didn't think it was relevant or they didn't want to like ruin the representation. But for me, he's classic Asperger's. Vicky says, maybe not intentionally, but certainly has many traits. And that's, you know, it's positive for me. For instance, I might say, OK, well, you know Sheldon Cooper, because most people have watched The Big Bang Theory, pop culture. It allows someone to attach an idea. So if, for instance, I'm working with someone, I say, oh, you know, you know, a bit like Sheldon Cooper. It starts giving that idea. Unfortunately, Sheldon isn't always represented as a group. He is a good character. But he's a bit marmite, you know, you love him or you hate him, which I guess sums up autism quite well, actually. April says, as I said in a previous webinar, Sheldon can be seen as an unintentional interpretation of autism. Despite this, I heard that Jim Parsons studied autism for the role. Yes, I remember you saying April. So the actor definitely saw it as an autistic character, even if the writers did not. Next, we've got Atypical. Atypical is a Netflix series. I kind of, the show's okay. You know, I don't love it, but I don't hate it. If you're, if you've got a, like a young child, it's probably a good starting point. It's this guy, Sam Gardner, and he's, you know, got atypical autism or Asperger's and it's him. It's like your typical teenage drama, but from the point of view of someone with autism, sometimes I think it's a little bit over the top. I don't personally resonate with this depiction, but as we know, autism is unique to every single person. So as long as it's very clear that it's individual, which I think the show does do, particularly in the second season when they introduce another character, I think he gets a girlfriend who has autism as well, but in a very different way to him. It's, it's not a bad representation. 
So Trevor says, RE Big Bang Theory, uh, there's a lot of people in the tech and science industries who exhibit traits of autism and no official diagnosis. That might be why Sheldon was never classified. That is a really good point and definitely makes sense. If any of you have seen Atypical, do you like the representation? Do you think, you know what, this is how I want autism to be depicted? Or no, they're way off the mark here. OK, a lot of people haven't seen it, which, you know, it, it, should, it is pop culture because, you know, Netflix. But I still don't think it is mainstream enough. So we've got one person who thinks it is. I'm leaning towards good, but I met not for me, as I don't see myself in that character. I don't watch it. And I think that's the key thing. If, I, if my friends watched Atypical and they related his mannerisms and characteristics to me, I think I wouldn't like that. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of on the fence. Annie says, I am really enjoying the sessions. It's given me so much to think about, especially things I never thought about regarding ASD. But obviously it's very individual. Oh no, great. Well, I think about my students. I think Atypical represents ASD quite well, but obviously it's very individual. Yeah, I would say it's it's OK, to be honest. I think autism representation has a long way to go, but it's not bad. Puppet shows. Now, I did our own category just for puppet shows because there was more puppets who are autistic than you would think. This is one is Julie. So Julie is a little Muppet from Sesame Street. And she was originally done with a partnership from the Autistic Self Advocacy. However, as they continued the development of the character, the society, um, the autistic society stopped representing it because they didn't like how she was represented anymore. So that's really interesting. A great example of working with the community, but then also kind of like going away from it. The first episode shows Julia acting a little bit different. And one of them, well, what's going on with her? And they say, oh, you know, this is just Julie. She, she thinks a little bit different. Uh, there's a great example when Elma introduces her. I personally really like this representation. I haven't seen the later seasons. I don't really know why the autistic advocacy group stopped um, supporting them. But I can definitely vouch for the first few seasons that she was introduced. Lisa says, if you only watch TV, you might think only white boys are artistic. That's a good point, actually. There really isn't many females. Also, people who are not white, any other colour under the sun, it's always depicted as the same. You no, know, Rayman, Atypical, you know, those are the Sheldon, those are the ones that come to mind. Tony says, is atypical used interchangeably with neurodivergent, both opposite to typical and neurotypical? Yes, atypical is more used in America. Essentially means, you know, atypical, like not top, not typical. It's interchangeable, but less so in the UK. And agree, boy represented more than women completely. Last one is theatre. Theatre is an interesting one. You've got The Dog in the Night Time, but we already spoke about that. So I want to speak about a play called All in a Row. And this is about a family dealing with autism. I've not watched it, but I do know it was really controversial at the time as it depicted the disorder as a puppet. And they, did the, they, they depicted it as a puppet for a few reasons. One, because they wanted, you know, the lack of emotions. They wanted to show that the person felt very different. With a puppeteer, they could move it in like a different mannerisms. That was the positive reasons. The negative reasons, though, was it shows that, okay, are we a different species? You know, are we so devoid? Like the, the puppet looks scary. You know, it looks dead. <laughs> and, you know, it's like it's not able to show the same. So on one hand, it's demonstrating how people with autism can struggle with showing emotions. But on the other hand, you know, we're not a puppet, you know. <laughs> so I'd love to know what your thoughts are on this particular representation. I'm more against it than I am for, but I can appreciate the reason why they thought it was a good idea. And lastly, video games. 
Video games have very, very early days in representing autism. However, there has been a few instances, and a few of those instances include Bioshock, Bioshock uh, The Elder Scroll, and Mass Effect 2. None of them are like integral parts of the story, but it is great to see autism featured in video games, particularly as there is a link between playing video games and autism. Um, autism originally comes from you know, being alone, being isolated, enjoying your own company. And video games, though are a lot more online now, is quite a solo sport or activity. So it makes sense that people who create video games would want to put a little bit of themselves in the game. So Chantel says, can you please do a talk or a blog on terminology and how to use the words correctly in sentences? Absolutely. I think we do have some webinars coming up saying like how not to talk to a dyslexic or an autistic i think they are coming up or they're definitely in the pipelines but i think we may have something on our website i'll see if i can dig it out so on video games we've got mass effects 2 and this is a character who is explicitly states to be an autistic servant i don't know about the word autistic servant to be totally honest with you he says i've been counting separate anything in particular he actually does mention it in the subtitles i apologize the subtitles are so small but this character is very much autistic. When you listen to the way he speaks, it's a very kind of like jagged, uh, it, it doesn't flow very well. However, it's nice to have a little mention. I think for video games, representation is only just starting to pick up steam. So yeah, those are it. Any questions, if there's any people who you think I've missed or any kind of like final thoughts or views or opinions, I would love to know. I've only mentioned some of them today, but there's definitely going to be more. Autism representation is definitely further along than a lot of the other neurodivergence. However, it's not perfect. And I still think we the media tends to follow into the same routines time and time again. White, male, socially awkward, genius. And that only represents a very, very small part of society. I think we must call out ones that aren't doing it right such as like the film at music which if any of you have watched is damn right offensive or like boycott like if you thought that the play with the puppet wasn't your cup of tea but also praise ones like if you like atypical watch it rate it comment on it these shows will only keep getting made if there's interest and a market for it media at the end of the day is the best tool we have to spread awareness not a question, but I just remembered the book Odd Girl Out and M is for Autism about females with autism. Nice. I didn't I've heard of M for Autism, but I've not heard of Odd Girl Out. I will definitely include those with the next one. One represent, representation recently is The Queen's Gambit. Nice, Sharon. I've been meaning to watch that so much, but uh, from what I've seen, absolutely. Thanks again, Nat. And yeah, get in contact. If any of you have resonated with what I said today or want to learn more, just go to exceptionalindividuals.com, email us admin at accept.co.uk or nat at accept.co.uk, and we'll go from there. It's a fascinating area. I hope you learned a few things today. I've definitely learned a few things from you, and I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. So thank you very, very much as always. And the fact you can all keep up with my rapid talking is amazing. So great definitely look up the accountant on netflix i will watch the accountant i haven't watched that yet and thanks for all the recommendations hope to see you at future webinars absolutely trevor would be great to have you again we've got so many upcoming ones every single week thanks vicky nice perfect definitely thanks jane all right i'm gonna go now but it's been amazing having you and have a great rest of your day bye all